Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the channel. Super Jesus Jackson, back at it again. This time with an addendum to my Rebel Moon movie review. Zack Snyder's Rebel Moon, one of the biggest things to ever hit the planet. Or at least, we Zack Snyder fans hope that was the case because... Let's be honest, um, the reviews are absolutely murdering this movie right now, uh, and I literally said that in my review, starting off, <laughs> because it's true. Just so much hate with this movie right now. I mean, I can I can look at the, 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 the Rotten Tomato score right now. Let me refresh it. 23% critics rating, 67% audience score. Now, granted, a lot of that audience score, because the movie is not a theatrical release, uh, because it is a streaming movie, pretty much for the most part. There's only a few, uh, you know, very minimal screen, not even a limited theatrical release this movie had. It wasn't even that. It is mainly a streaming movie. There is no way to, uh, to um, basically authenticate uh, someone's audience review uh, as to whether they've seen the movie or not. So if you haven't seen the movie, you can go on Rotten Tomatoes, create your little account, and participate in that audience score. And basically just never mention whether you watched the movie or not. You could just, there's plenty of people that stopped in before the movie came out and participated to this audience score and said, Zack Snyder is fantastic. I can't wait to see the movie. And they haven't even seen the movie. And that counts for the audience score because the movie is streaming. Uh, if the movie was theatrical, you could authenticate your review by putting uh, your Fandango tickets, your Regal tickets or whatever, and, 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 and certifying your review that way. But because the movie is primarily streaming, there were many people that did that. Now, granted, there were also people that did the completely opposite, but that is the case. So, 67% to a 23% critic rating is not the most accurate score, but granted, it doesn't fucking matter. You probably could, there's ways to fucking fuck around with everything. You could, I'm sure there's, there are ways to loophole everything, and at the end of the day, if you want to review bomb something, you totally can. You could just, there's ways to do it, okay? You, you could watch the movie, you might have liked it, but you're, you fucking hate Zack Snyder, so you're still gonna give it a shitty review. Like, there's no ways to, uh, to circumvent that. But, that audience score is still relatively way higher than that critic score. But really what we're concerned with are these negative reviews because Rebel Moon, just with the major trades and the major outlets, and even like, you know, other movie reviewers out there uh, and, and, and plenty of other movie commentary channels uh, have been giving this movie not the best reviews. You know what? I'll just read you the critical consensus here uh, on Rotten Tomatoes. Rebel Moon Part 1 A Child of Fire proves Zack Snyder hasn't lost his visual flair, but eye candy isn't enough to offset a storyline made up of various sci-fi fantasy tropes. Audience says, even if Rebel Moon Part 1 A Child of Fire borrows heavily from other sci-fi stories, it's still entertaining and often visually dazzling. That's what I agree with, mostly. Uh, obviously, if you've seen my my review, I, I gave it a much more dazzling review. I said it was a fucking masterpiece, which I still think it is. I still have yet to see it twice, or uh, yeah, one more time. But mainly that critical consensus there, I think that is in line with even a lot of the negative audience consensus. Look, number one, the fact that it it's very traditional, or not traditional, the fact that it's very derivative and that it borrows from other aspects from other movies like Star Wars, Battle of the Stars, you know, Dune, Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven, that is, to me, that is really not a, um, I don't think it's a fair criticism because Star Wars even is not original, okay? Like, nothing is truly original, okay? Like, like, you're... <laughs> Lion King is basically a ripoff of Hamlet, but yet we love the Lion King, you know? And who's to say Hamlet was not a ripoff of something else? You know, and West Side Story, for example, which is a more obvious, you know, direct interpretation of Romeo and Juliet, but we love that, right? But that's that's a little bit more on the nose. Uh, whereas Rebel Moon here is trying to tell you, it's trying to portray itself as if it's original. So I understand that. But either way... I think using the argument that it's too derivative of sci-fi fantasy tropes, I just don't agree with that. I, I don't think that's a valid criticism because as long as the film is entertaining, and I mean, for God's sakes, the, the whole gathering of heroes characteristic, uh, you know, the Seven Samurai, Magnificent Seven, that is not, I mean, that, 
that that's an aspect of a film, you know what I mean? Like, it's such a, I don't know, you can't own that or claim that, you know what I mean? Like, if, if a movie adopts that, it doesn't mean that that's a negative. Just because the movie's derivative of other things we've seen before doesn't, it's not a negative to me. Because even fucking Magnificent Seven is <laughs> basically Seven Samurai for white people. That's what that movie was. You know what I mean? So you, you, you can't just like, you can't just do that. Like, I, I, I don't really agree with that. And that movie was, uh, you know, well regarded as well. So good and evil. I mean, what's next? You know, it's derivative because there, there's a good and evil storyline to it. I mean, come on. Like, that is literally the basis of our stories as human beings. So, yeah, I don't agree with that at all. Um, so that's that. Everyone loves the visual flair of Zack Snyder, okay? But even so, some critics, from what I read and from what I heard, a lot of them mention, uh, slow-mo the slow-mo is too much slow-mo first of all it's Zack fucking snyder okay what do you, what the hell do you expect but also number two i don't know if the slow-mo is good and it's it makes the action sequences awesome i don't care how much he uses i mean i do care how much he uses it but i don't think he uses it as much as you th as people said he he uses it i just really think people are getting tired of that Zack snyder's crappy uh storytelling according to them and so um it, it causes them to think negatively of other things even that Zack Snyder may be doing very well you know so they don't have as much tolerance for the slow-mo uh, because they're already biased against Zack Snyder because of their criticism on like I said on the things that they don't like about him which is his storytelling and uh the dialogue editing all that and granted I think I forgot to say with the uh derivativeness I, I don't think the story is, yeah, the story is derivative of other things, just like every fucking thing that exists in this world, especially music. I mean, especially music. That, that Like, I love how, like, when it comes to movies and, and film, you can't be very derivative there, but you can be as derivative as you want in music, and we're okay with that. I mean, you know, we're okay with people using uh, the creep chord progression uh, over and over and over again in music, uh, and the same fucking Taylor Swift chords over and over and over again with all these different pop songs we're okay with that but we're not okay with with being derivative in film i'm a little peeved as you can tell uh, i i don't know it's it's sunday it's christmas well technically i'm mexican it's christmas for me it's the 24th if, if you know you know but anyways I, the day i'm the day where i'm supposed to be jolly is is quite the opposite i'm quite I can't find a, another word. Anyways, and now the third thing, I think the biggest part is the story and the way that the movie's structured. I mentioned in my review that the movie is, it's Seven Samurai, right? The exposition of the film, okay, is there is this giant menace to the galaxy, right? This sort of uh, authoritarian dictatorship, galactal fucking, you know, uh, threat. And so uh, we're going to gather a bunch of heroes. And so that is the movie going to all these different places and gathering heroes. And so a lot of the people's criticisms were there is not there's so much. Actually, there's so much exposition. There's so much exposition that it just feels like a an unfulfilling movie um, because it, it's literally just go to this place, get this person, go to this place, get this person. And that's it. Like, that's literally the movie. Look. If that's your criticism, sure, but, like, that's the point of the m part one movie. Now, granted, I'm not I'm not here to tell you that just because, you know, it's a part one, it means that this movie alone can't stand on its own, and it's okay that it doesn't stand on its own, and that's why there's a part two. No, I'm not, I'm not that person. I do believe that if you're going to make a part one, it's got to be a fulfilling movie. I think it is a fulfilling movie, character development-wise, but we'll get to that a little bit later, but... That that is some of the criticism, right? Is that majority of the movie is the the main characters bouncing around these different places, gathering each other up or whatever, and that's pretty much it. I understand why that is the criticism, but the problem is that is you just didn't like how it was done. <laughs> like that's that's the problem. The actual formula is not bad. It's the way that it was done. The formula itself, that's what it is. But the action sequences in these moments. The dialogue in these moments, you get a lot of people, you know, they, they mentioned how there's no character development. You go to these places, you learn the type of person that this character is by what they're doing in that scene. <laughs> like, like there is one person, there's one character in the movie uh, and you see it in the trailer. It's the guy with the chains, uh, the guy with the, uh, you know, sort of handling the griffin. There's no fighting in that in that sequence. There's no like actual punching, violence, whatever. It's it's him and the griffin. Right. Like and we know who he is 
And and there's something beautiful that he says to this griffin that completely relates to the, the journeys and, 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 and the journey and the story and, and the themes of the movie. Did, like, critics just miss that? You know what I mean? Like, did they not understand that, like, yes, this is, a, you know, cliche and just basic, you know, our main characters go to this guy to recruit him and then... Yada yada, he he gets this bird or whatever, and then we're good. We move on to the next thing, and we do it again in a different way. Like, but did did people not to stop to think the actual substance and the actual depth of every single recruitment scene? You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing that kind of annoys me is that people just they talk about the structure and they talk about the way that the movie uh, handles its story. I, I guess I'm just supposed to assume that the the dialogue and the events of every of of, of those moments in the movie, you know, just weren't weren't enough to justify doing the movie's story that way. Does that make sense? And so, but but no, I'm not, I, I guess I can assume that, but I just, to me, I just don't understand how people can look at the way that the movie's structured and basically just throw everything out, you know what I mean? Like, throw the baby out with the bathwater, you know what I mean? Like, that's sort of what I think it is, is like, I understand why you think it's derivative, I understand why you think it's lame, it's super expositional. Uh, it's 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 so heavy on that that there's no payoff. That you just crap on everything altogether. But like this, there is depth and substance in each scene of this movie. You know what I mean? Where all that derivativeness is. That's my thing. And really, there's payoff at the end. There is character development here. You know, what I mean? there's character development in this movie. You know what I mean? The whole point of this movie is. There's so much beautiful contradiction and so much depth here. It's called Rebel Moon, right? Um, the idea of a rebel, an outcast, a black sheep, that is each and every single character in this film. And every time we go re to recruit one, and the characters that we're presented with from the very beginning, they are outcasts. They are black sheep. They have done bad things in their lives. But they are trying to remedy it. They're trying to be better. They're trying to to grow. They're trying to find themselves. They're trying to have identity by, by becoming something greater than themselves, fighting for something greater than themselves. But really, they're trying to survive in a world where they were put in, where they felt restricted, where they felt chained, where they felt oppressed, right? And they're, they're, they're trying to break free from this because they're misunderstood, and that's, isn't that the fucking, the, the story of all of us? That's Jesus Christ, for God's sakes. The fucking tenet of transcendentalism is, one of the greatest philosophies is, it's great to be mis misunderstood. You know what I mean? Like, I just, those, those are all things that are present in this film, identity, and that being a rebel doesn't necessarily mean that you're bad. Maybe you made some mistakes, maybe you fucked up somewhere along the road. But that's not your end goal. That is not your whole book. That is just a chapter of your life. And there is hope in you. And there is light in you. And there's a way to extract that out and to fight for something greater than yourself. You know? Like, I mean, I don't know. It's about meaning. It's about finding meaning. <laughs> about finding purpose when you think it's all lost. You know, like, and that's what each and every single character in this movie strives to do. And you see it in every one of those sequences. You know, where we, where, we, where we meet them for the first time. That's the point of this movie. And it's completely um, contradicted by the villain of the movie. His, the villain of the movie, his fucking name is literally Admiral Noble. Noble. So it's this, it's this terrible fucking authoritarian asshole force in the galaxy. And the main dude's name is Admiral, Admiral Noble. I mean, that contradiction's fantastic. Not to mention that they paint themselves as the saviors, right? That, that, that's what that is. And the dude surrounds himself with these skull red monk-like figures with the, the crown of thorns on their sides. That's fucking beautiful. It's genius. Like, are, are, the contradiction of who they really are, they're wolves in sheep clothing. Or wolves. Whatever the... However the fuck you say it. I'm Mexican, okay? English is my second language. But you know what I mean, right? So that contradiction with these rebels, you know, people who have done bad things in this film, who are trying to be better, trying to fight for the, what they believe in, trying to fight for something greater than themselves, having meaning. And, and, and they're fighting against this authoritarian force that presents themselves as holy, as they can do nothing wrong. 
That's really fucking good stuff. And so, I'm sorry. I just, I'm, I get really worked up. It pains me when something so good is just being completely overlooked. You know what I mean? And that is what Rebel Moon Part 1, A Child of Fire, is. Oh, and the dialogue. Um, Look, a lot of people said this about Batman v Superman, uh, even uh, Man of Steel, even Zack Snyder's Justice League, how Zack Snyder's movies, the dialogue in them, they're so fucking... It's not good because it's 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 trying to be too artsy. You know what I mean? It's trying. It just it, it, like the characters don't speak like how people speak. I'm like, dude. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry that Rebel Moon's dialogue is borderline Shakespearean. Okay, that that's what I'm gonna say. Is it my fault that you you're just? What do you want? I mean, you want like a spoon fed? You want spoon fed dialogue? Is that what you want? And even so, some people did criticize its basic dialogue and how some of it was a, a little bit too. It's that thing where like a character is saying something that completely shouldn't be said or something. Like it's so obvious that they don't need to say it. I totally understand that. And to be fair, I did have a couple moments in the movie where I did feel that. But afterwards, I talked about it with my girlfriend. She was like, she explained to me why they said what they said and why they could have said what they said. And I was like, all right, yeah, you're fine. You're all right. Trust me. I used to watch fucking Mexican soap operas. I know what bad dialogue is. <laughs> I used to watch them with my mother, okay? But, you know, I've seen bad movies with shitty dialogue. This movie is not it, okay? This movie kind of, the way characters speak, they speak kind of regally. They speak kind of like they're, they're speaking to an audience. It's very Shakespearean. Like, it's very thespian. And I don't see how that's a problem. I just don't know what, what people want. You know what I mean? Like, like, if it's too simple, they criticize it. If it's trying to be too, you know, sophisticated, then it's trying too hard. You know what I mean? Like, I don't fucking know. I think the last thing I'm going to say is some people mentioned uh, the, the the criticize the movie's use of flashbacks. Look, I hate flashbacks, but this movie made them awesome and made them fit. Okay, like they completely were needed for the story, but also when they did happen, I understood why they happened. They didn't feel out of place. And so, you know, maybe this is a thing where it's just, you know, I guess people just thought they, they were out of place. I don't know. But I thought they fit perfectly. So, and again... The way people speak in these flashbacks can be very thespian and very, you know, ah, and very, I, I had no recourse but to feel this pain in my heart. I have, like, you know what I mean? Like, it, that type of shit. And I, I don't know. I, I thoroughly enjoy that. And, and granted, look, even through everything that I've just mentioned right now, you know, a lot of people, you know, are going to say, well, dude, like, why are you expressing your opinion, opinion as if it's fact? Look, it's not fact. I know it's not fact. It's my opinion, right? We, we know this. I don't need to say that, but I, again, I'm saying it because I, I know there's going to be some of you who are going to be annoyed. I just feel really passionate about this. But yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I guess it just comes, it comes down to preference, right? If you don't like it, you don't like it. But, and there's a reason, I mean, I don't know. It's just, there's a lot of things here with Zack Snyder. I think a lot of critics, I think, uh, I think genuinely people just do not like Zack Snyder's movies and the way that he tackles them. I, I do firmly believe that. I, I, it's not like I think that people are out to get Zack Snyder. But also, I think there's a lot of culture, cultural politics involved in this. I, I do think so. I think that there's a lot of people that kind of look at Zack Snyder's work and kind of tie the fandom to that work. And you know what? Maybe for good reason, because there's people like me shitting on those reviews. And maybe you hate me. So, you know, whatever. But look, you know, whatever. It's people's opinions at the end of the day. You could try to be as objective as possible, and you can't. Even me, I feel like I'm, I'm being objective, but... I love Zack Snyder. I mean, I, I, I'm very biased towards him. I totally understand that. But, you know, at the end of the day, I, you know, people just don't dig Zack Snyder's style. It is what it is. Um, and I actually saw a post on Twitter the other day that was actually really interesting. But this one person said, they showed like a really an amazing shot of the movie. Uh, and they said, if this shot was done by any other director uh, and from any other movie, they would have been praising it. But because it's Zack Snyder, they just don't. They don't. They don't fucking care about it. And I just completely was like, yes, 100%. So that's, if there's any indication of some sort of negative, uh, you know, bias against Zack Snyder, I mean, maybe there is a little bit of that, you know. But again, I think overall people's opinions are their opinions, right? I don't think there's this, there's this huge initiative to shit on everything Zack Snyder, but I do think there's a little bit of that. Oh, and actually, a final criticism, um, you know, some people that are mentioning that the CGI is a little bit weird sometimes, how it looks a little bit under budget, or it looks a little bleh, you know, uh, it looks a little, like, cheap, or whatever. It's so funny, because the first, the first sequence of the movie, the, the opening of it, 
Um, I not the direct opening, but sort of the scene after the opening. I think you'll know what I mean. There is a it it looks kind of like like it looks really good, looks amazing, but then there is a certain moment where you look at it and you're like, this looks like a fucking like a stage. Like, you know, like a sound stage. Like it looks like they they adorned it. It it looks like that. Now, granted, every fucking movie that you see like every Marvel movie, for example, uses sound stages. Okay, like it's not like they go shoot, you know, actually out. You know, like most of the time they they make it look at least the immediate area, the vicinity where the characters are, and then they put a bunch of green screen around, right? But here in the, in in Rebel Moon, it looked very obvious that that's what that was, uh, and not very, but you know, you you could see it. Here's the thing, though, I kind of see like th- 300, for example, and I see that same thing too. That movie was shot in one fucking room. I mean, it, it was in it was in a sound stage. That movie was shot in a sound stage. That's all it was. But it's so funny. Like, it looks awesome. It's like it's a part of the aesthetic. I actually think it's like, especially a movie like Three Hundred. Like, you look at it and you're like, yeah, this is fake as hell, but it looks awesome and it actually adds to how awesome it looks. It's that thing where like, if it looked real, too real, then it wouldn't be a movie anymore. You know what I mean? And so because there's an aspect of sort of fakeness to it and there's an aspect of make-believeness and it's an aspect of people just dressing up and everything around them looks kind of fake and it looks very staged, you know what I mean? Like it just, it adds to the to the greatness of it. It adds to the appeal, to the escapism of it. I think it's brilliant. I think it's this mature way of like interpreting a you know, the, the child imagination of when you go to the woods or when you go, when you're in the, your living room and you're, you're doing your little air kicks and punches and you're imagining this fight in your head. Maybe I'm, I'm, I was a little boy. Okay. So that's what I did. It's like the, the adult way of like, you know, uh, expressing, uh, imagination is through these sound stages and kind of making a little bit obvious that you're on a sound stage. And that's, I don't know. I think it's, on purpose, I, I, I like. I wouldn't be surprised if Zack Snyder looks at it, and I tell him, "I'm like, I'm like this kind of looks a little bit like, looks a little too obvious, you know." And like, and I feel he'd be like, "Yeah, it does," <laughs> you know. Like, I don't know. That's what I feel. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Maybe he thinks it looks fucking phenomenal and completely real. And now, granted, this whole movie, I mean, there's so much of it where it does look like, yeah, this is clearly CGI. But I think it's 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 like auto tune. You know what I mean? Like, it's used as an effect. Like, it's it's fake and we can see it and it's a little bit more obvious because there's great CGI where it looks borderline real and then there's the CGI that just looks fake as hell and is really bad and then there's the CGI that is we know is fake obviously looks fake but there's no other way it would look other than that way you know what I mean like because if it was real well it can't be real and if it was real it'd be it'd be too uncanny too jarring it wouldn't make sense so it has to be a little bit more obvious that it's fake and that it's you know, kind of teeter tottering on that on that bad, you know, like like this is bad CGI and it's got to be right here. You know what I mean? Like it's got to be right there. And so that's and, and that goes along with the soundstage setup and all of that. And so I don't know. I think it adds to the coolness of it. I think it adds to the aesthetic. Uh, I think it's 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 awesome. It's like a perfect balance between fake and real. It's like when you hear a song and someone's doing auto tune and you're like, this sounds really fake, but it, like I can still feel some some uh some humanness out of it you know there, there's there's a nice aesthetic to it you know what i mean like i don't know how to explain it the final thing that i that i wanted to say and i know this video is already going way the fuck too long but the final thing that i wanted to say is that the one thing i am concerned about is the rated r extended cuts of this film or extended cut of this film that is uh zach center has been on record basically saying that the rated r version of this film will eventually come it'll be an extended cut and in a way that film is a different film it's a different experience and it's potentially a better experience look apparently netflix said look dude we'll give you the budget we'll give you the money to do that movie but also give us a movie that we can put pg-13 you know as well like that we can have as pg-13 and so that was the compromise right that's fine and all but like why didn't we get the ultimate version of this film? You know, because we do find that with ultimate editions and direct director's cut of Zack Snyder films, those tend to fare better critically and audience wise, you know? So why don't we get that fucking version of the film first? 
the why isn't that the only version you know what i mean and also has zack snyder not zack snyder not proved himself enough that there is a fan base out there for him you know what i mean like look maybe not maybe if people don't if, if studios don't trust in 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 him putting out his films theatrically anymore whatever i can understand that but like at least give the dude the ability to do his rated r 3 hour cut streaming like we know the demand is there. I mean, just look at the success of Zack Snyder's Justice League and Army of the Dead. You know what I mean? On, on streaming. I just don't understand this sort of hesitantness. But see, if it's not hesitantness, there is another aspect. And that is an artificial manufacturing of release the Snyder Cut craze, hype. That is the only other explanation to it is that Netflix is like, let's artificially create the hype for a extended Snyder cut of Rebel Moon. And that's the other explanation for it, which I think is the most uh, probable one. And that's the one that I'm worried about the most and that I dislike the most. And I don't know. I just don't see Zack Snyder going for that himself. Like, why would you want to do that? You know, it just sucks that he has to play ball with these studios. You know what I mean? Like, what, like he's an auteur, like, and, and, and he has shown that he has a cult following, you know, that people are willing to go and pay for this or, you know, and, and to show up, you know what I mean? Whether it's in theaters or on Netflix to watch the films. I just don't understand it. And so it, it really pisses me off that we're not getting the rated R three hour, four hour version of this film, which Zack Snyder himself has said that is almost feels like a different movie. His quote, that's what annoys me so much. And look, if I enjoyed the, you know, the crappier version of the film, and I thought it was great. I can't wait to fucking see that extended cut. But my God, why didn't we get that one first? That's the problem. That's that's really the main thing that I have uh, that that kind of fires me up with this. Uh, it's so frustrating. It really is. Oh God. I I just know I know it's not Zack Snyder. It's it's fucking business, you know, studio politics that you know, like and and, and business reasons. That, that that's all it is. Whatever. I'll be excited for when that comes out. Apparently next year. Um, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, anyways, and those are my thoughts about this movie and my addendum and, and sort of my response to the, to the critics review and really, again, why Rebel Moon is so great. Um, and, and how I feel about this extended cut bullshit. But anyways, I'm going to get out of here. Um, I got to go poop, <laughs> but thank you so much for watching. Um, I really appreciate your support. Give this video a like if you liked it, dislike it if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed this content. Uh, share with your Zack Snyder Rebel Mooning friends, if you will. If it's your birthday, happy birthday to you, you beautiful creature. But that's it for me. You all take care, stay safe, and until next time, I love you.